our speakers. So next uh, slide, please, Jesse. Yes, yeah, so today we will look at the shaping of the questionnaire. We will have an insight into the questionnaire. So the different questions that will be asked and also some of the indicators. We will discuss how you can encourage participants to people to participate in the survey. And then we will look at how the survey results will be published and what we can provide. And then lastly, we will hear from patient organizations and how they've been using the results in their own advocacy work. So Sandra, if you can start by explaining us a bit more about the shaping of the questionnaire. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Andrea. So first of all, I just want to say good afternoon, everyone, and uh, mention that I'm extremely enthusiastic to be here together with you to be launching this uh, survey on diagnosis. It's such an important topic for the rare disease community, a cross-cutting issue. It's also obtaining a diagnosis is the first key to access care, to access the treatment, and to access clinical expertise and social care and it's also the only a way to prevent irreversible effects uh, the disease can have on patients. So I um, will first start to explain the different steps uh, that uh, led us to design this questionnaire and to design the whole, the whole project. So first of all what we wanted to do with this survey um, is to measure the time that is necessary to obtain a diagnosis as a rare disease patient. So it's a very important indicator to raise awareness about rare diseases. And it's something that we will measure for, for the first time across diseases and across all countries in the world. We also want with this survey to understand the different steps that lead to uh, a diagnosis for, the, for rare disease patients. So we uh, know from the literature about the different steps but from a medical point of view and this with this survey what we want to do is to gather input on what is the diagnosis uh, journey from a patient point of view what we want to do also with this survey is to define the obstacles limiting access to diagnosis so we know about some of them such as the lack of scientific knowledge on rare diseases or the lack of training uh, of healthcare professionals but we also want to measure the obstacles that can be a little bit more individual, for example, such as um, the level of education or um, the difficulty accessing center of expertise in some areas, for example. We also want to identify best practices, tools, services that help rare disease patients to obtain a faster diagnosis. And this um, is also well known from the services that have been implemented in the recent years. I'm thinking about, for example, the center of expertise that helped uh, to diagnose many rare disease patients and to improve um, the time necessary to obtain a diagnosis. But there's also, and very certainly, other uh, factors that help patients to obtain a faster diagnosis. Finally, what we want to do with this survey in the context of, you know, major scientific breakthrough, the development of new genetic testing technologies, artificial intelligence, and also meta-symptom checker, for example, we want to identify the role of new te technologies and how they've been uh, able to help patients in their diagnosis journey and measure if potentially there are inequalities to access these technologies. Uh, next slide, please, Jesse. Um, so for this survey, we have adopted a mixed method approach. So um, first of all, we have conducted a literature review. So Jesse Dubiev, uh, my colleague here in, in this call, has conducted li this literature review to identify the gaps in the literature and also identify some hypotheses that we would need to confirm with this survey. So just to give you an example, we have seen in the literature that women have might have longer diagnosis journey and also that, for example, symptoms of women were treated later than symptoms uh, from men. So what we want to do with this survey is to confirm some uh, of those findings at international level and across all rare diseases. We have also organized an online panel to be able to refine the concept of diagnosis 
and identify what's new in the field. We wanted to renew um, the question that uh, we have in this field. I'm going to uh, talk about this exercise a little bit later on. We have also organized a topic expert committee that contributed to identify issues and indicators to be included in the questionnaire. Also, our networks of national alliances had the opportunity to provide input on topics and indicators to be included in the questionnaire. And finally, the questionnaire has been tested with patients and carers to make sure that the question were meaningful to them and also that we were actually measuring what we wanted to measure. Yes, thank you, uh, Jesse. So as I was saying, um, we have adopted adopted a mixed method approach for this um, exercise. And the first step was to organize a qualitative phase. And um, so we have organized uh, an online deliberative forum where 61 participants uh, participated in English. We have also organized eight individual interviews for, for those who weren't able to participate in English. Also, in this exercise, 46 diseases were represented, so a wide range of rare diseases, and also 25 countries. So within this platform, participants were able to talk about their individual journey to diagnosis, and also they had shared um, space where they were able to express um, common issues within the rare disease community and also discuss um, on common solutions that could be implemented to improve the diagnosis journey of people living with a rare disease. With this community, we have seen how difficult and sometimes devastating it was for patients living with a rare disease to obtain a diagnosis. We have um, seen the feeling of isolation and um, that, yeah, that patients uh, were experiencing. So we have just... Um, uh, here uh, specify the, one of the quotes from this exercise. So facing the unknown, feeling alone, dealing with tremendous pain, affecting my emotional and mental health, facing a monster without a name, not knowing what I have to deal with and if I could fight it. Within this um, uh, platform, we have also identified um, the journey of rare disease patient from a rare disease uh, perspective. And what was extremely interesting was uh, to see this experience in a more maybe dynamic way. So what we've seen is that at each different step of the diagnosis journey, rare disease patients were experiencing a loop with maybe some questions that were answered. They were seeing some specialists that help them to progress in the diagnosis journey. But each time there is new question that arise because there is a lack of information remaining because very often there is no treatment for the disease. So it was extremely interesting to see how patients are experiencing this diagnosis journey. Also, we have gathered extremely interesting um, input from the undiagnosed network. And see, just to give you an, an example that some undiagnosed patients were actually uh, stopping their search for diagnosis um, because they were afraid of uh, the consequence. So it's just to give you um, some example. Uh, now um, I'm also going to speak a little bit about the topic expert committee that we have organized. So this topic expert committee is multi-stakeholder. Um, it is comprised of uh, patient organizations. Uh, that have had all organized um, consultation on the diagnosis uh, topic. Uh, we have also included a patient uh, um, representative representing specific networks within the rare disease community. So first of all, rare disease patients, um, uh, rare cancer patients, sorry, uh, were also represented. Um, undiagnosed networks of patients were also represented and also Pay, uh, networks of international patients to make sure that the international perspective was considered in the design of the questionnaire. We have also um, industry representative within this panel, within this panel um, uh, that are participating in particular in the global uh, commission to end the diagnosis of disease of children living with a rare disease. Um, we have also industry partners uh, from companies um, of uh, new diagnosis technology. And um, uh, we um, have also healthcare professionals uh, represented in this uh, panel. 
and also a uh, member of uh, your this uh, staff uh, who have provided their expertise in uh, policy, uh, in the most recent policy development in the field of uh, diagnosis. Finally, uh, sociologists were also represented, sociologists that have organized um, surveys and consultation on diagnosis issues in the past. Next slide. Um, so I'm going to pass the floor to my colleague, Jessie, who's going to give you a little insight into the quantitative survey. Oh, no, it's still me. Sorry. Uh, so just wanted to mention that the survey will be running from today um, to until the 15th of June. And within this survey, um, we really want to insist uh, on the fact that all patients living with a rare disease and their family member can participate in the survey, including former and recovering patients, uh, such as can, uh, former cancer um, patient. Also, undiagnosed patients are more than welcome to participate in this survey, and we will make a specific effort to represent this community in our uh, survey. And also, any experience of diagnosis. So it's very important that not only patients with long or difficult journey to diagnosis participate, but also patients with um, easy uh, diagnosis so that we can um, identify best practices and what helps them to have, obtain a faster diagnosis. Now I will pass the floor to Shaoloni, our colleague who has working with us on developing the international side uh, of the survey. Um, thank you so much, Sandra. I think the international side is, is quite exciting because we're trying to do something very important and very unique, which is developing a survey that would be relevant to different regions and also support global advocacy. So um, the work around really changing or transforming the context for persons around the world. Um, in this, we're in partnership as well with the Global Commission, a multi-stakeholder platform around diagnosis to really see if we can really make a survey and make the findings of the survey pertinent, not just to Europe, but also to rare disease communities um, outside of Europe. And we've been really fortunate to work with uh, six national alliances from, from six countries that are kind of a test case for us to see whether or not um, we can, in these specific countries, um, disseminate the survey and, and get findings that are relevant both at the national level, but can also be fed um, into the global context. Um, with this in mind, I've seen Luciana is in the call as well from Argentina, from the Argentine Alliance that we're working with. We're working with uh, Australia, so Rare Voices Australia, uh, Vidas Raras in Brazil, the Malaysian Society in Malaysia, uh, Rare Diseases of South Africa, and also the, um, the U UAE Society for Rare Diseases. In order to ensure that the, the findings and also the dissemination is, is global, is international, um, um, I think this is one of the first surveys that will be using Malay and Arabic um, as one of the survey languages, which is, I mean, useful in the European context, but also in, in the global context. Um, what else did I want to say? Right. And so for us, I mean, we're hoping that the survey can work on two levels. The one is that for the national alliances, it can provide statistically significant data to really drive that national advocacy and those national advocacy priorities around diagnosis and really for RDI to provide us with, with a set of findings that can help um, motivate at the national level. Um, thank you so much, Sandra. <clears throat> just wanted to mention, um, in addition to Cheryl and you, as just said, that also we've been organizing this international pilot uh, in the context of the Global Commission to End the Diagnosis ODT for Children Living with Rare Disease, enabling to extend the scope of the survey, as well as organizing um, the qualitative phase of the survey. Jessie, now it's yes. your turn. Thank you, Sandra. So hello, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to be here with you today. And I will talk a bit about the content of the questionnaire and to give you a glimpse into what will be into the questionnaire. Uh, so first of all, and given that we're talking about diagnosis and time to diagnosis, we have many dates. 
uh, in this questionnaire, which is quite unusual for us. Uh, we don't usually ask for specific dates, but here we will ask for the month and year of several steps of the diagnosis journey for rare disease patients. And especially we will first ask for the month and year of birth of the patients and of the carers, if it's carers who are answering to uh, the questionnaire and also the dates, uh, so the month and year of different uh, steps of this diagnosis journey, the first symptoms, when the first symptoms appeared or when there was a first uh, an idea that something was wrong, the first symptomatic treatment, uh, when the first medical contact for this disease, for the rare disease happened, um, when patients were first referred to a center of expertise, when they had their, their initial diagnosis, which we defined here because we have to define it in some way uh, as the first time they heard the name of the disease, and also the month and year of the confirmed diagnosis, which uh, we defined also as uh, when the name was confirmed by appropriate uh, tests. And the reason we will ask for specific dates uh, is that this will really allow us to calculate many indicators that all of us can use for advocacy purposes. So the first, uh, of course, the first indicator that we will use will be the average time to obtain a diagnosis. And we will measure that from the first symptoms to the confirmed diagnosis. But for instance, we will also be able to calculate the average time for uh, people to access a confirmed diagnosis from the time they were referred to a center of expertise. Or we can also look at the average time to obtain a diagnosis depending on the age of the patient when the first symptoms appeared. So really with all of those dates that will allow us to have a lot of information on the diagnosis journey of the whole rare disease um, population, but also for specific rare diseases uh, or specific countries, for instance, as we will see later on. But in addition to those dates, uh, we have several topics that we uh, included in the questionnaire, and we will have a glimpse into those different topics uh, so that you can see what's inside the questionnaire. Um, so there is, of course, the status if uh, re the respondent is a patient or a carer, but also the diagnosis status if the patient has a partial diagnosis, an initial diagnosis, a confirmed diagnosis, or, or is what we call an unsolved case, case uh, which, is, which means that they are undiagnosed. Uh, we have some questions on the symptoms, um, so on the parts of the body impacted by the disease, but also on the types of symptoms to see if there is any consequence on the time to diagnosis, depending on the type of symptoms um, that patients are suffering from. The prevention, so as because we are looking for factors uh, that allow access to diagnosis and that ease access to diagnosis, we will see if uh, people were diagnosed before birth, were diagnosed as part of a newborn screening program, or if uh, there were also people in their family that already that had already been diagnosed uh, before themselves. And probably the fact that the disease is known in the family helps uh, for the diagnosis. We also ask about the number of medical contacts that uh, the patient had before they reach to the, 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 the diagnosis and uh, if they were referred to a center of expertise. We also have some questions on misdiagnosis. So we ask them if uh, we ask uh, respondents if uh, the patient was misdiagnosed already. Uh, would it be a physical misdiagnosis, a psychological misdiagnosis, and what were the consequences of this diagnosis, misdiagnosis? We ask them if uh, they had access to support psychological, financial, um, if they had support for uh, care coordination, or if they are part of a patient group or were part of, the, of a patient group uh, during the, their diagnosis journey. We ask for the name of the disease uh, as it appears in uh, the orphanet list of rare diseases. 
and we ask for the consequences or of having or not having a diagnosis, such as access to care, understanding how the disease uh, will progress, financial support, integration at school or at work, access, um, access to social services and to financial products, uh, social life, impact on social life and reproductive choices uh, from the parents and from the patients. We also have questions on diagnostic tests. Would it be genetic tests or other types of tests, including the satisfaction of the respondents with the time uh, it took for them to access those tests and uh, the time for them to receive their results? And we wanted to have a specific focus on genetic tests uh, to know more about uh, problems in accessing those, texts, the, those uh, tests, the type of genetic tests that uh, had been done, the, if they were uh, run through a private laboratory or company, if uh, patients are satisfied with the, how the results were delivered to them, and if they had access to genetic counseling. And finally, in order to allow everyone to really express themselves and uh, say what they want to say uh, regarding the diagnosis of their rare disease, we have open questions uh, on the obstacles encountered during the diagnosis journey and on the factors that help them obtaining the correct diagnosis. So this is just a glimpse into the questions, um, but uh, my colleagues can add in the chat the link that we have to a full PDF version of the questionnaire in English only because we don't have it in, in, in other languages, but you have access online to the whole questionnaire in English in PDF. So you can really go look at the questions uh, that will be asked in this survey. And just to also give you a glimpse on what we can do uh, with uh, those results. Uh, so that's an example that we are taking from a previous survey that was run in France. And that gives you an idea of how we can see the different steps and when the different steps happen uh, of, the, of the diagnosis journey and the differences between people. So we can have this kind of representation for the whole a community of people living with rare diseases, but also here, for instance, we see that uh, in this survey, uh, women accessed uh, symptom management, ha had their symptoms treated or cared after uh, their diagnosis was confirmed, while was, in average, it was before for male. Um, and also we can see the difference diagnosis journeys for different uh, word diseases. So that's something that uh, we can do based on the results uh, of the diagnosis uh, survey. And finally, uh, we really wanted to be able to measure inequalities in access to diagnosis uh, within the rare disease community. So that because we thought that in order to help everybody access fast and uh, accurate uh, diagnosis, uh, we should also tackle some specific issues uh, that some subpopulations can face. So based on the questions of, of the questionnaire, we will be able to see inequalities in access to diagnosis depending on gender, age, country, geographical area, and ethnicity. But then also based on the calculations that we can do um, from the questions of the questionnaire, we can also see inequalities based on disease characteristics such as the prevalence or the incidence, the transmission mode, the functional consequences of the disease, and also on country characteristics. If they have a national plan for rare diseases, depending on the number of centers of expertise in the country, or if the countries are more centralized, decentralized, regionalized, etc. And now I will pass the floor to my colleague Andrea, who will tell you more about how to encourage participation in the survey. Yes, so first, uh, Jesse, if you could go to the next slide. And then on the link, I don't know, Jesse, if you would like to explain a bit more around the, uh, the tailored online dashboard before I continue on the communication toolkit. Of course.
So we I have to stop sharing for a while so that I can show you the unlashed online dashboard. I just wanted to men mention very quickly that uh, we have encountered uh, internet connection difficulties this morning. So we are trying to make our best so that uh, everything is okay, but uh, we've been facing some major obstacles. <laughs> is it working, Jesse? Yes. Great. I will now share my screen again. Can you see the dashboard? So this is an example of a dashboard that we had, for instance, for the survey that we did on rare disease patients' experience of COVID-19. So you see on the dashboard and it can be really tailored to your needs, meaning that it can be uh, only for one rare disease or one group of rare diseases or for one country or for a group of countries. And then you'll have, you'll be able to follow up the dissemination and to see how many people responded for your disease or your country. And also to see some demographics, uh, for instance, the uh, gender of the respondents or uh, the status, uh, either patient or carers. And also you will have access to some indicators that we will be able to uh, give you before the end of the, um, of the, of the dissemination field work. Uh, even if we will not be able to give you access to all of the answers right away, but you will already have some key indicators uh, that will be uh, provided with this dashboard. So I will reshare the presentation, but the idea is really that you can access this dashboard every day uh, and see how many respondents you have. So you just need to send us a, an email uh, on our rare barometer team um, email at rare.barometer at yourwordies.org or you can also write in the chat your name and email address and your needs so that we can within just a few days uh, send you a link to this online dashboard that will be tailored to your needs. So once again, yeah, it really in this um, slide you have all the information and yes one thing is that these uh, dashboards are available in the 26 languages of the survey so uh, given it that it's just the question everything has been translated so you can have it in uh, any of the 26 languages by country disease disease group or it can be even a disease group in a country or a disease group in a region or in a group of countries for instance Yes, so now I will uh, explain to you a bit about the communication tool we have created. So the communication toolkit is available in 26 languages and it exists of a social media image, a suggested social media messages, an email template and also the rare barometer logo. So you can see to the right an example of one of the visuals. Or these are only meant as inspirations. You are free to communicate about the survey just like you want, but we would really much appreciate if you could add the rare barometer logo uh, to any materials that you are sharing about the, the survey. So all of this can be find, uh, found on our website. We will share that with you uh, later on, uh, but we would really much appreciate you helping us spreading the word about the survey, sending it on your social media accounts, uh, sending emails to your members uh, included in the newsletter. And you can also do what we are doing today, host a webinar or even do a Facebook live session. You can link the survey to a relevant local, national or international campaign or awareness uh, day. And you can also invite the Rare Barometer team to come and speak at uh, your events. Um, and also, as, uh, as Jesse shared uh, the, the dashboard, you saw an example that you could really get a good uh, insight into the dissemination work that you are doing. You can see if you have how many participants that you already have, 
maybe if there's not enough, you can see as well where the participants have uh, gone upon the link. So we saw as well that Facebook uh, is one of the main places where people click on the links. So uh, share it on your social media. We will post uh, on our Eurodis Facebook account, Twitter account and uh, LinkedIn account today. So please feel free to share that link or go to the communication toolkit and uh, download the materials yourself. Thank you. So now we will uh, go through um, the analysis uh, of the results and what this will provide. So um, what I just wanted to explain is that we will all work within our respective scope of activities. So for example, this will first work on analyzing the survey at a European and international level. So the overall result of the survey. And based on the, uh, this overall result of the survey, we will first issue um, an academic publication. So we aim to publish the results in an academic journal in October. So we will kindly ask you not to release the results of the survey because you will have access to results of the survey in advance um, before they are actually published in an academic uh, journal. Something that is new for this survey is that you will have, uh, for the first time, the possibility to be associated with the publication. So we had feedback from some of our member organizations, especially from small patient organizations who uh, were um, find it like difficult to make uh, their, the work they've been doing or the way, the fact that they were associated to this work and to publicize this. Um, to be associated to the work we've been doing. So we will um, provide you with the possibility to be associated with the publication, to be recognized in the academic publication so that uh, we recognize your dissemination work and so that you can, uh, we can help you to raise awareness about rare disease uh, issues in your country. Uh, for this survey, we envisage several publication formats. So we could do, um, as uh, we did for the Share and Protect Our Health Data Survey, and pu publish uh, the overall result together with recommendation in a more policy-oriented journal. Or we could also publish the results um, in a more social science-related journal uh, with, um, for example, uh, publication oriented toward like identifying social inequalities within uh, the, the accessing diagnosis as, for rare disease patients. Um, so still working on this uh, overall result, one the academic publication will be out. We will also work on a graphic report. So a graphic report with the main finding of the survey on the overall result of the survey. It will be um, a six to eight pager approximately uh, with a nice uh, graphic design. And we will also work based on this fact sheet on a condensed fact sheet. So just a one or two pager so that you can um, disseminate the overall result of the survey uh, with, uh, for example, policymakers that don't necessarily have the time to go through a very long um, uh, report. Also, uh, we will, um, following uh, this work we've been doing on the overall results. Um, Jesse, can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, we will also uh, provide you with a um, tailored fact sheet that will be based on the tailored dashboard that you have received. So ha as we were saying in the beginning, you can send us um, a request saying, OK, I want a dashboard uh, to follow the result of my dissemination work in Spain, or maybe for um, to follow the result of how many uh, respondents have taken the survey for cystic fibrosis in Europe, for example. And based on this result, we can issue tailored fact sheets presenting the results and the number of respondents for Spain, for example, or for France only, or for a specific disease, and presenting specific results for your target population as well. And this is available, again, upon request. So you can still contact us at rare, uh, that org and ask for your tailored fact sheet. Uh, 
after that, um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, what we um, are going, what we are planning uh, in terms of uh, communication of the results. So we will organize our uh, European Conference on Rare Diseases end of June, and we will present the preliminary result of the survey at this event. We will also uh, present first results of the survey at the Czech Presidency technical meeting on early diagnosis and newborn screening. Once the result will be published academically, we have also planned to um, um, present the result at the high level conference on a roadmap for a Europe's action plan. And we also plan to organize an event at the European Parliament with our European pa uh, parliamentary network uh, of well, for rare diseases, uh, but also beyond. Um, it will be an event organized for all parliamentarians um, at, the, at the European Parliament. We will also um, hear, uh, we want also to hear from you if you identify, because it's of course like very uh, uh, early stages in thinking about the communication of the survey. So if you have um, events, if you have conferences that you think would be relevant for a presentation of this survey, please do not hesitate to contact us uh, for um, a presentation of the survey results when they will be ready. Then, as I was saying, we will all work within our scope of activities. So we will analyze the overall result of the survey, but you will also have the possibility to analyze your own survey results. If we can move to the next slide, please, uh, Jesse. So <clears throat> you will have the full result of the survey uh, because as we were explaining, so there are some questions about the dates uh, and after that, we need to calculate duration, for example. So we will provide you with dashboard, with the tailored result for your scope of activities, but with um, all the indicators that were provided in the questionnaire as a second step. Um, and also based on this result, then you will, be, you will be free, if we can move to the next slide, Jesse, um, then you will be free to communicate about the result as you like. So of course, and we have fashion organizations that are doing it systematically. You can communicate about the survey results on your website. You can analyze the targeted survey results yourself. Um, you can also issue academic publication based on the survey results. And it's also an opportunity to maybe compare past surveys that you have organized with our own survey data uh, in order to maybe gather more meaningful insight or to complete uh, some as aspects that you haven't the time uh, to explore. So I'm not going to open all these links, but they are just here for you that uh, you can consult them afterwards and they can be inspiring to see what kind of publication you can be working on or what type of analysis you can conduct based on the survey result that will be um, targeted and tailored to your needs and to your scope of activities. Yes. Uh, yeah. And now we will hear from Dorica Dan. Please, Dorica, the floor is yours. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me to present uh, how we try to use the data from uh, rare barometer, previous rare barometer surveys uh, to change the system uh, in Romania uh, for caring uh, patients with rare diseases. Uh, next slide. So we, we started uh, with the problem because uh, we presented uh, the results of the survey everywhere to our conferences, uh, to, to the, uh, the national authorities. We printed the results for Romania with the uh, fact sheets and uh, uh, we, we tried to, to publish it everywhere in order to, to show uh, the impact of the rare disease in Romania and uh, the, the major problems of patients with rare diseases. So uh, we, we have um, uh, tried to demonstrate that uh, rare disease have impact not only to the patient, but to the entire families. And uh, if we have 1 million patients in Romania living with rare diseases, 
it means that uh, it, the entire if and the entire family is affected it means that 20% of our population is affected so this is a huge number and uh, we we try to show them that uh, they have problems on the everyday life uh, uh, there is an impact on their capacity to carry out their daily tasks uh, they have problems with the uh, um, sensorial functioning personal care they have uh, behavior problems and uh, so many problems and uh, the time burden is very important for uh, people living with rare disease and their carriers, especially because uh, uh, of the uh, daily needs uh, for care coordination. So the time burden is uh, very difficult and uh, uh, falls heavily on women, which are the main uh, carriers of people living with rare diseases. And uh, the waiting time until the patients uh, with rare disease are diagnosed is uh, very long. And we, we try to, to demonstrate uh, 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 the, to the national authorities that uh, if we uh, take the right measures, we can reduce the waiting time for patients, families, and uh, can produce uh, economies for the healthcare system. Uh, next, please. Uh, also, we, we demonstrated that uh, if we don't solve this problem, uh, the, the families, the patients and the families will continue to have a poor quality of life, which means 1 million patients with rare diseases. Next. Also that uh, it uh, will uh, have an impact uh, and severe economical burden for families and society. Uh, and we need uh, um, workplaces uh, for uh, parents uh, or for patients. Uh, we need uh, flexible uh, workplaces and uh, adaptation uh, to allow them to, to have a workplace and to uh, to recognize that uh, we need to adapt the system to the people in need. Next. Uh, also, if we don't solve the problem uh, and the carriers will continue to spend two to six uh, hours per day only on uh, a treatment related task, uh, it will have, it will create a lot of psychological uh, problem and impact, and uh, we uh, for the healthcare system, it means uh, even more costs. So uh, we try to identify which are the systems uh, from where uh, these problems are deriving, and we, well, of course, we we have uh, seen that the system of education uh, have a, an important impact. Uh, uh, because we don't have enough experts for rare disease, no curricula in uh, proper curricula in uh, medical universities, and uh, um, also the other specialists, not only the doctors, but also psychologists, therapists are not uh, studying properly rare diseases. Next. Uh, also, in the system of diagnosis and care, there is a lot of problems uh, because uh, the care pathways are, are not structured. Uh, people uh, are uh, losing a lot of time until they are identifying the right services for them. The care services are fragmented and uh, there is a lack of coordination. We have different ministries for social services, for medical services, uh, different coordination and not enough budget, of course. And uh, next. And uh, uh, of course, uh, monitoring system uh, is lacking because we don't have a national registry for rare disease. And because of this, uh, healthcare system uh, and uh, national authorities doesn't know how to, uh, how to create services according to the needs of patients because they don't have uh, data. Next slide. So we, uh, we have also the, used the opportunity that our center, Noro Center, is a resource center for rare disease. And uh, uh, we are combining in our center uh, therapies, therapeutic education, training, medical and social services. We are connected with the majority of the centers uh, for expertise in Romania, which are part of ERNs. Uh, and uh, we are also part of ERN, ITACA, and uh, Rare Resource Net. Next, um, we have we are providing an integrated and holistic health care, health and social care in our center through uh, medical, social services and uh, trainings. 
We are providing trainings, for instance, for patients, parents, professionals, and journalists. And uh, uh, this way we try to use data for our advocacy to upscale our experience from the center in, uh, uh, in all uh, the, the healthcare system and try to identify which are uh, the main stakeholders that can, uh, can uh, uh, help us with care coordination. Uh, so if we introduce in the, all the information and data in uh, the updated national plan for air disease and in the national strategy. In fact, today we had the debate on the national strategy for health. And uh, uh, in the local strategy, uh, we, we also advocated to have new services for uh, case management for patients with rare diseases. We have uh, um, advocated to have new standards for social services and this new standards uh, uh, for uh, social services uh, for rare disease are adopted and new standards for medical services are under development still. Uh, we have uh, started the training courses for case management for air disease uh, for uh, and creating uh, uh, community support networks. So we identify uh, community nurses uh, and uh, uh, advocated to have in their job description case management for air diseases because we have community nurses all over the country, 1,850 community nurses, and the number will increase. And we trained uh, until now 350 community nurses in a partnership with Ministry of Health. And we are continuing this training to become uh, case managers and to, to be connected with the centers of expertise in order to, to uh, support patients to find the right services uh, in a shorter time. And we also train 800 doctors uh, through another project uh, that is called Pro Generale together with uh, medical universities in Romania. Uh, we, of course, we communicated uh, the results uh, during, uh, in our events like workshops, rare disease day, trainings, conferences uh, through different publications and at Radio Noro or Rare Disease School for Journalists. And I would say that the journalists uh, were very involved and uh, supported uh, us to reach our goals. Um, for all these activities, we, we were recognized and received a prize that is called Innovation in Health. Uh, so the impact of uh, using data to change uh, the care system and to change uh, the way authorities are um, um, changing the measures for, uh, to answer to the needs of the patients is very important. So, but it's needed uh, intersectorial partnerships. Uh, you need to, to change the legislation and we change the legis legislation for community nursing. And we also integrated case management in the social assistance law. And uh, uh, we use the training curricula that we developed in, in off care, but we also created uh, a new system of uh, training community nurses, which is called ECHO, Extension of Community Health Outcomes. And uh, it is a system that is accredited by uh, university from New Mexico. And uh, in order to, to be sustainable, because we knew that we will never have the enough funds to, to support so many people to be case managers for patients with rare diseases, um, community nurses are hired by the local authorities. So we introduce in their job description, we train them, but they are paid by the local authorities. So this way, um, our project is uh, somehow also sustainable. And now we are working to introduce a system to support their activity, which is a virtual case management tool. And we hope that uh, all these uh, things will uh, help us to reduce the waiting time until the patients uh, are getting uh, the right diagnosis and the proper care. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dorica. So next we will show a video. If you go to the next slide, uh, there we have Lisa Foster, Chief Executive from Rare Disease Disor Rare Disorders New Zealand, who has kindly sent us a video message. Oh, the sound is it.
I guess I need to unmute. Kia from New Zealand. My name is Lisa Foster and I'm the Chief Executive for Rare Disorders New Zealand. We represent the 300,000 people in this country who live with a rare disease and their families. And we amplify the collective voice to improve healthcare and well-being. Our opportunity to explain our gratitude and the benefit of having uh, support or connection with the rare barometer team and the surveys that they offer um, is, is a privilege and an honor. So it's um, just to explain one example, we had a survey which included COVID-19 results, um, which New Zealand took part in, and we had some infographics created from that survey. We were able to take those details and evidence and infographics to our politicians and push the case for advocacy and inclusion for the people living in this country facing the challenge and risk of COVID who have a rare disease. This was priceless and um, a lot of benefit for us to make our job easier to explain things and provide those specific details. I know that diagnosis is also an area of major concern in this country. And on Rare Disease Day in New Zealand, we are launching our new white paper, which is based on a <coughs> survey that we completed, the largest ever survey in New Zealand. And that survey was based upon Rare Barometer survey that they have done in the past. So this also gives us the opportunity to do comparisons with Europe and to show where the gaps are, where the alignments are, and where the opportunities are for improvement. This again is a major plus when we are facing such an uphill battle. And unfortunately, we still have no recognition as a population group, even though we have this evidence. So the journey has only begun um, and we do need to continue with our advocacy. So this is something that is vital uh, for this country in particular. We have a campaign in New Zealand, which is called the Fair for Rare campaign. Um, and we are calling for recognition, inclusion, and a national framework for rare disease. So hopefully we get some opportunity to have that put in place. Kia ora from New Zealand. Andrea, we cannot hear you. Oh, sorry, I was on mute. So then we have also a video message from Claudia Cluisone from the, the Managing Director of HHT Europe. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today, even though only virtually with this video message. But we really did want to share our experience on using rare barometer surveys with you. My name is Claudia Crucione, and I'm speaking to you on behalf of the board and the members of HHG Europe, which is a federation of rare disease organizations for HHG. Now, we have to be very straightforward and honest. We have been around since 2012, and we've done many, many activities. We're a very strong group, and most of all, from day one, we've always been in contact with Eurotis and participated in any activity or initiative that was proposed by Eurotis, Eurotis itself. Yet, when we received over the years the rare barometer surveys, we made sure we disseminated, but we really never understood the scope and the potential that there was underlying in the participation itself. And something really drastically changed during COVID times. And I wanted to share that experience and a few tips and tricks for you. So of course, we were a little bit lazy in analyzing and understanding uh, what these kinds of results could mean to us. We sort of always focused on the general rare disease statistics that came out of the survey. So we participated but we never really used them because we felt to a certain extent that maybe they were a little bit distant from our day-to-day -day action plan. Then COVID unfortunately hit. For us, it was a moment of great 
a united spirit. We, in March 2020, <coughs> we began meeting once a week, all the delegates that were available online to anticipate needs of patients, to develop action plans, to understand, because we were all in a huge uh, confusion and with very little direction. It was a total novelty for all of us. And one of the things that we discussed during those weekly meetings and think tanks was that we really did not have a picture of what was happening, of the impact on patients. It was so different from country to country. Um, communication was more difficult because people were more absorbed by their daily difficulties. Being online wasn't still as traditional as it has become today. So over the first few months, we were sort of reinventing the wheel, looking for information and developing a strategy just based on our own personal experience. None of us had the expertise, the know-how, the capacity, the instruments, and the time to develop a survey, but in our hearts, we knew that was essential. And then the rare barometer survey appeared and it was, we looked at things in a totally different light. So at that point we disseminated in a completely different way compared to how we had done it before. We were very sure and made very sure that when we shared on social media, through our newsletters, in online meetings, we encouraged everyone to participate, specifying that those results would be significant because we would have a picture of the HHG communities country per country. And that would allow us to understand and to advocate better. So, it was the need that brought us to a new approach. And I think this is essential to share with you. Uh, what was the result? Well, it was our first time disseminating in a very difficult moment when people were um, focused on other kinds of news coming through. But we did get a very high participation over average compared to other things we had been doing in the past. So we got great numbers, especially for two or three countries that allowed us to analyze HHC replies for France, Germany, Italy, and base our future actions on the needs that emerge from that survey itself. It was a roadmap that we didn't have before. Now, <clears throat> this has changed our entire approach on working with rare barometer surveys. So although we always have disseminated, we will do it differently now. And in a nutshell, I would like to tell you who has benefited from the data that we have collected thanks to rare barometer. The patient organizations that have planned their work together, our national centers, because being nationally based, our national HHG centers were able to exactly see what the patient community was going through and the data was quite evident. And the Vascurin. So we are in the ERN Vascurin and we shared that same information with them. And of course it was an extreme value. Never forget that all of this data is collected in such a professional and scientific way that it does back any of your initiatives mm -hmm. from a scientific point of view. And it's almost impossible to accomplish. Well, it's not impossible, but it surely involves so much more work and expertise that we don't all have when these kinds of surveys are run by national organizations. So don't miss this off opportunity in the future. Uh, maybe all of you were a lot better than us in using rare barometer studies, but uh, we were maybe the black sheep and we learned our lesson and we're very grateful. So in a nutshell, if you were a little bit lazy like us, make sure you keep an eye on all the surveys coming out. Study the surveys before you disseminate them, because this way you have a possibility to discuss 
inside your national organization or your federation for your rare disease and understand the potential. If you understand the potential of those results, you'll be able to convince the others when disseminating. Make your emails extremely clear. So tell people how long it will take them to uh, fill out the form. Remind them that they will find their own national language. That is very important because sometimes they see titles in English and they'll be discouraged. Remind them that you are there if they have any questions. And most of all, what we saw, saw was extremely appreciated is promise and make sure you do it that you will feedback the results in an online meeting or in a specific newsletter. This will encourage participation, adherence. People go through the entire survey. And the more we educate them to participate, the more they will participate if we feedback the results and how those results has helped our work. So for us through COVID times, it's been a guiding light to have that information. And, uh, and I'd love to hear all the other experiences and see if this can be of any help for all of you out there. A special thanks to the team um, from Rare Barometer because uh, not only for this, the work you've done in preparing these surveys, but also for all the patients you have in feeding back and giving us our rare disease specific, country specific results. They're invaluable. Thank you very much. So maybe uh, just a few words to recap a little bit because many things have been said uh, by our patient organization network and thank you very much to all um, Dorica, Lisa and Claudia for um, providing your, your experience. Um, so it was uh, really interesting, first of all, uh, to, to understand how data um, are necessary to actually make the case and to highlight a reality. Um, nowadays, if you don't have data to prove what you, you, you are saying, so it can be uh, the, the impact of rare diseases on uh, your everyday life, as Dorica was saying, uh, the reality doesn't simply exist. So it's extremely important to be able to use data to prove and make the case for rare disease patients. Also, uh, what was uh, really important in what has been said is um, the time it takes for us also to explain what you can uh, get from this uh, survey results and what you can have available for your network. So yes, um, we have all the data at European and international level, but we can provide extraction breakdown, subsample of uh, the result for your uh, scope of activity. So the survey result only for Spain, only for HHT, only for Romania, for example, so, can, so that you can use those data in your own country or for your own disease. Also, um, I think it was really important to mention how you can encourage participation, and it's very important to show the to feedback, as Claudia was uh, saying, uh, participants, and to show the use uh, that will be made of the results, how we are going to present the result, how you, uh, you will be able to use the result, and how it's important for your advocacy work. Uh, because we know that there is a lot of survey fatigue, fatigue, sorry, we are aware of that. And this is definitely the only way uh, by showing that the result would be useful, would be useful to improve the lives of people living with rare disease, that we can encourage participation. Because as also Claudia said, it's important to have as many participants per um, country, also for one um, diseases in one country. So it's important to have uh, a lot of people answering. We need to be many to be able to do those detailed analyses. And that's also very, um, very, very important. Also, I like how uh, all of you showed uh, where we can use the result, where you can use the result for grant application, for making the case for specific projects such as case managers, for example. Um, and also, as Lisa was saying, um, it's uh, the comparison is very important. So for example, if you can show uh, the impact of national plans, 
in European countries, if you live in a country that doesn't have a national plan, that's also very, um, very important. And uh, I think, uh, yes, I think that's it. I'm going to stop uh, uh, there. But thank you very much. It was extremely interesting to hear about your experience. So now we are going to take questions. Yeah, we have some questions in the chat and then we also have one question on the Q&A. Someone asked how long it will take to fill in the survey if it's a big effort for the respondents. So, so it will be uh, so uh, it will be 20 around 20 minutes. So of course, depending on the profile of the respondents, uh, it can be a little bit uh, uh, you can have a little bit more questions. So for example, you have less questions if you are undiagnosed, for example, because you don't have the question about the consequences sorry, of having the diagnosis. Uh, but yeah, approximately, and we have measured this with um, patients and carers uh, from our network who tested the questionnaire, it will be approximately uh, 20 minutes. So I think it's reasonable. Uh, we have really worked on trying to reduce the length of the questionnaire because this issue is definitely um, very wide and we had to select uh, the indicators that we wanted to implement but we I think we managed to keep the um, to keep the the number of questions uh, reasonable. We also have a question on when you will receive the recording so that I can answer. So we will upload the recordings right after the webinars and it will be available on the Eurodis website, but we will also send it to you by mail. And I think, uh, Sandra, you answered some of the questions already about the uh, publications. Uh, but we also have a suggestion here from A.K. Tong, who mm -hmm. says that regarding the publication, I hope each country, so it's, this is a suggestion, uh, which is open to discussion, that each country can have one or two representatives who will contribute in reviewing the survey questions in the local language and liaising with the members to be included. Yes, yeah, so regarding the... Um... Uh, the verification of the translation. So uh, we are working first of all with a company uh, that is specialized in medical translation. And there are like uh, several back translation and proofreading of the translation. So that's the first step. And then afterwards, the translation has been uh, checked with a patient organization from our network. So native speakers in one of the 26 languages and also uh, patient representatives so to make sure that um, the vocabulary that is specific to rare diseases was um, um, accurate and, uh, and also relevant. Uh, if you uh, notice something that is really problematic or there is like a major issue in the translation, we never know, feel free uh, to send us a message so that we can see what we can do uh, to, uh, to amend the questionnaire if necessary. Um, sorry, I'm a bit confused with all the questions. Uh, so we had a question from uh, Eva Schroeters also, uh, so saying, did I understand correctly, that we will be able to extract country and disease-specific results? Uh, will it be possible to extract the disease-specific result per country? Yes, it will be possible. All the breakdowns of the results are possible. The only condition is to have a sufficient number um, of, uh, of respondents, but also it's something that we can discuss together because we can um, definitely understand that some diseases uh, are affecting only a few people in the world. So in that case, it will be a uh, different, uh, but normally we have a threshold of 30 respondents, but theoretically, Every breakdown that can be useful for your advocacy work can be um, uh, run uh, and carried out so that you can have the results for your advocacy work. Yeah, if I may, it's really the reason why we also made this webinar. It means that if you have enough respondents, you can have the results. So it's really if there if the survey is disseminated and if enough people have access to this survey and answer this survey then you can use the results for your advocacy so it's really it's not just for us to have the overall results because most of the time 
we do have many respondents to give overall results. But then if you want to be able to use the results for your country, your disease, or your disease in a country, then you need to have enough respondents. And this dissemination phase is really crucial for you to be able to use the results. We just I, got a uh, comment then. There is someone is asking how much is enough or what is enough. So what would you say is enough respondents? So as I said, we have a threshold of 30 respondents uh, that you use to, um, uh, to provide the dashboard and analysis of the result. But then, as I said, it needs to be discussed because if, it's, um, if we have only 10 respondents uh, out of a uh, population of 2,000 patients, of course, it's not a lot. But if you have 10 patients from a disease that's affecting affecting, sorry, 10 patients in the world, then it means that all patients are represented in the survey. So as I said, this uh, needs to be uh, discussed, but 30 um, is the threshold that we have adopted. It's a convention um, for, uh, to conduct statistics. And to ensure anonymity also uh, of the respondents. Uh, I saw a quick question also from uh, Eva Schroeders uh, that um, asked about the question um, on the symptoms and if the symptoms, uh, the question about when the symptoms were actually treated. So it's um, this is the way we presented this on the slide, but the question about when the symptoms have been treated uh, will come after uh, the question of the first medical contact, Eva. You can access uh, the flow of the question uh, in the PDF that we have posted, and also uh, the link is included in this PowerPoint. We have in the PowerPoint, and you will receive this PowerPoint anyway uh, when we end the webinar, but you have all the links that you need. Uh, so the link to the to the survey, to the link to the PDF version of the questionnaire, to the communications toolkit, uh, you have everything there. So regarding also uh, the question on the publication, so maybe I didn't, I realized that I, I didn't uh, answer uh, the question completely. So at that stage, as I said, uh, the questionnaire is out now. So it's only um, on a uh, you know, marginal aspect that we'll be able to amend the questionnaire. But I would say that if we want to, <clears throat> um, uh, you know, organize the publication together, uh, another option for your participation would be to discuss the results and to see how the results um, fit into your national or disease uh, context. And that can be definitely um, uh, an added value to our analysis of the survey. So I, it's great. I see um, that we have a lot of requests that we have received also uh, via email um, about dashboards uh, to be receiving the result of the survey and to be able to follow the dissemination work. Um, I think we've answered pretty much all the questions. Uh, at the beginning of the webinar, there was a question mm -hmm. on the languages, uh, especially if Bengali was one of the languages. So I think uh, Shaolini uh, has uh, replied. So uh, we decide on the language. So first of all, normally our surveys are translated in 23 languages. So you can see the languages that are included in the first page of the, of, uh, the survey. And uh, also it needs to be decided beforehand uh, because now the, the, as I said, the questionnaire is out, but we can still discuss for future projects uh, how we can include the more languages uh, into our future projects. And Eva is asking if uh, one of us can do this presentation for the members of her national alliance. Yes, so as we were saying, uh, we will be able to participate in any of uh, your meetings. Of course, our only limitation is uh, that we can do this in French, in English, possibly in Spanish, uh, but we will be limited in terms of languages. But I guess um, uh, it's um, in French, so it's going to be uh, yeah, definitely possible. And 
don't hesitate to come to us and to ask for our participation. Um, and in Norwegian, sorry, yes, I forgot. Um, so we will be uh, uh, more than happy to participate in your conference to encourage participation. Or it could be also, I don't know, we can think about a video with subtitles or something like this. This can be discussed. A uh, question from Alessandra, uh, to, uh, I didn't see your entire name, uh, Toscana, sorry. Um, yes, we did. So um, I don't know if you saw Alessandra uh, on the page uh, showing the composition of the topic expert committees that Simona Belagambi uh, has participated in um, the topic expert committee. And uh, they are um, always uh, taking part in the dissemination, analysis, um, design of our survey project. So yes, uh, Uniamo has already participated in our project. Any further questions? As I said, all and as we said, all this material will be av available, the PowerPoint, the recording of the webinar, and feel free to um, ask us questions uh, to our rubber metal address. Also, when you continue and when you disseminate the survey, because uh, it's very possible that the question uh, comes from your um, network of patients, uh, as we, it happens very often. So I think we can maybe close this webinar. Yeah, I'm just adding once again our email address in the chat, just in case. But uh, thank you very much to all. Uh, I hope, and it seems that the information we have uh, will be useful. We will keep disseminating this information, well, the questionnaire, of course, but also giving this information in um, with our members and also within the EPAGs, so the patient group uh, that are part of the ERNs. Uh, so once again, as, I, as we said in the Q&A, there is a three months field work. So that's quite a long time to be able to disseminate the survey. And that also allows, and some of our members already told us that they would do that. It also allows to disseminate this survey in a different period um, or in a different time than other surveys that you would be running. For instance, we have some members who have already uh, been running surveys and who are running surveys right now. And so given that you have the three months period uh, to disseminate this survey, that gives you more time to um, change a bit and to leave your members some time to, to rest between two surveys. So um, yeah, please share the link, talk about the survey, and we will make sure that you get the dashboards that you asked of, um, for and, and the results, of course. Thank you very much to her all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.